Hare Krishna, everyone. Welcome to this week's edition of the Hare Krishnas in Britain podcast. This is episode number 63. Uh, thank you to everyone who tunes in on a regular basis to, to find out about our guests, where he or she is from and what they're up to. Uh, and I'm really pleased that we've kind of returned to Great Britain uh, in one sense, because we've had a few guests from overseas. And I realised around 10, 15 episodes ago that we that even though it's called the Harry Christians in Britain podcast, devotees from um, overseas wanted to be involved. So I'm <laughs> pleased to be back in the UK. And we're actually going back to Scotland. Scotland is one of my most favorite places uh if i had to if i had to settle down <laughs> it might actually be in scotland um i'm pleased to welcome our guest this week ramananda prabhu Hare krishna Hare krishna very bold Hare it's great to have you with us um yeah i can't quite believe i saw the reaction on your face when i mentioned 63 i can't believe we've got to episode <laughs> 63 you're the 63rd guest uh ne so... next one will be more auspicious 64 oh, 64 yeah oh just realize who that's going to be <laughs> but 63 is also a wonderful number as well so mm -hmm. ramananda let's kick off by you telling us a bit about yourself and where you're from okay um so is this the how you became a devotee thing or yeah i mean that's or, kind or of the of... that's kind of the next question how do you okay. meet the devotees this is kind of pre Hari krishna life Okay, so I, well, I was born in Blackpool, uh, 1974. Um, I, I grew up in Blackpool right up until I joined the temple in uh, 1995. Um, so I grew up in a sort of Christian family. Mm. Uh, I went to, I always went to Church of England schools, Christian schools, went to church every week, uh, sang in the choir. I was an altar boy carrying the cross and lighting the candles. But I, I, in hindsight, I really didn't understand what it really meant to be a Christian. I was christened. I was confirmed, um, sang all the songs, had a, had, I, I, I believed in God. Mm -hmm. I believed I had a soul. I believed in heaven and hell. But really, you know, I didn't I don't think I ever read the Bible from cover to cover, uh, read a few passages. In fact, it wasn't until I can't remember, probably about 13 or 14 years old in our school, uh, the Gideons came and they gave everyone a Gideon's Bible and they showed how to use it. That you go to the back, you find the particular inspiration that you're looking for, and then you'll find Bible verses which relate to those challenges emotional issues and so on and i think that was the first time that i actually had a little glimpse that this is this is something practical and and relevant to how i live my life it's not just you call yourself a Christian and then you go to heaven, but mm. it's actually, it's a meditation. It's a process. Um, but I wouldn't say that I was ever a serious Christian. Um, when I was sort of 16 years old, well, when I was around about 15, I started being a little more rebellious. Uh, my musical tastes became much, much more specific and uh, when I was 16 years old, I started experimenting with psychedelic drugs and, you know, smoking marijuana, LSD, mushrooms, ecstasy, all these kind of things. My musical tastes also became they, they evolved <laughs> along with along with the lifestyle. Um, and I think around that time I started sort of questioning things uh having and and not just me actually i was part of a fairly large tight group of friends who were all really on the same page we we all had very similar sort of mutual group experiences expand and and by no means am i trying to advocate for psychedelic experimentation but my personal experience and something which um something which uh 
uh, we dis- uh, I discussed with some devotees recently, actually, was that it's not that these type of experiences necessarily open up one's mind to spiritual inquiry, but more that people who already have uh, a sort of subtle spiritual nature and inquisitiveness, then that may sort of push them further in that direction. Um, my, my eldest son was recently visiting my father in Blackpool, and he was asking my dad what what was what was my dad meaning me like when he was younger, and my dad said he was always very, he was always much more spiritual. Uh, he was never really interested in material um, progress and and career and so on. He was always much more spiritual person. Now my dad never said that to me. He never said to me when I was younger that he saw that in me. And I didn't necessarily see it in myself, mm. but I think it was there. There was there was a, a sort of leaning towards spirituality, which kind of got pushed a lot further along um, by psychedelic experimentation. Um, and then when I was probably around about 19, 18 or 19, I was at a friend's house and someone gave me a copy of uh, Jonathan Livingston Siegel by Richard Back. I don't know if you've read that book. <clears throat> it's a really wonderful book. Very short book. You can read it in less than an hour. Um, it's basically about a seagull that realizes that there's more to life than just trying to catch fish. Mm. He realizes that actually he has this gift of flight and so he should aspire for something higher. And then it's all about him. He goes through many lives. It, it speaks about reincarnation. It's a very spiritual book. And it re- it was the first time that I felt like I had actually found something solid in my hand that I, I could read that really, really resonated with me. I felt that I'd actually found the, the, the sort of, it was like opening the door to... A, a philosophical understanding uh, of spiritual life. Um, so that kind of around about that time is when I, yeah, that, that was when the doors opened to Krishna consciousness a little bit more. Um, just to, um, I'll actually find the exact quote. Let's see if I've got it in my notes, because this is something which always really, um, uh, no, I'm not going to find it here. I'm not going to find it here. So I'll just paraphrase it. Mm, I'll just please, paraphrase yeah, it. Please. In in the famous verse from Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, the Ado Shraddha Tata Sadhu Sangha, so the, the different stages of Bhakti. So the very first stage is Shraddha, which we understand to mean faith. Faith. Mm. But when you look at the word for word, you look at Srila Prabhupada's word for word for that verse, he translates faith as being an interest or a faith in Krishna or God or or spirituality or a disinterest in material life. So we tend to think of faith as being something positive that I have got. But actually, for many, many people, in fact, for, I, I think probably for most of us, if we really look at our journey in in spiritual life, mm. it very often begins with this a sense of there's got to be more to life than this. Mm. You know, I don't have faith in this. And so I'm looking for something else. I haven't found that something else. I haven't found what it is that I'm looking for, but I know it's not here. And so this is also the beginning of Shraddha. This is also the beginning of faith. And so I think looking back, that was where I was at, at that sort of late teens period, was I'd come to the point of feeling very, very strongly that I'm not going to find happiness in sort of following this very, what I saw at the time as being a very conservative, old fashioned approach to life. Mm. Uh, yeah. So anyway, sorry, I'm going on. I'm going on. No, 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 it's fine. <laughs> I, just one question I that I have. Um, 
your you, you went to church as a child as a as mm -hmm. a teenager mm -hmm. were or are your parents christians churchgoers yeah i went with them every week my mother was always much more religious than me she yeah. was uh, sorry not than me than my father um my father was um he was in the police force um and for many many years he he was he had a very very good career in the police force mm. I could tell you something funny about that later on if you remind me. Okay. Uh, it's okay. to do with just remember Garanga Bridges and then we'll <laughs> if, it, if okay. it's appropriate. Yeah. If it's appropriate, we can get into it. But okay. um okay. my mother was more religious than he was. He had some experiences in the police force of see he, he saw things like murder scenes and um uh I, I believe on one occasion he was actually he had to investigate a house fire in which an infant had died. And it really sort of broke his faith in God. He he just felt like a, a God would never allow these kind of things to happen. And so he never tried to discourage my mother. In fact, he still went to church more as a sort of social duty. It was like, a, mm. a so you know, it was, he was, he was amongst other things. He was part of that social scene. And so he would go. Uh, my mother actually later on in life, after I became a devotee, she converted to uh, Catholicism. She became a Catholic uh, when she was in her, probably around her late fifties. So wow. Like mid to late fifties, she became Catholic. And I actually went, um, I went along for the ceremony where she um, officially converted. I don't know the, the name of it, but um, yeah. So they, my mother was quite a religious and spiritual person, uh, not so much my father, but I think if you asked my dad, he would probably say he's more of an agnostic than an atheist. Mm. He just he hasn't found any reason to believe in God, but he he kind of keeps things a little open, you know. That's good. It's good to have an open mind if possible. Um yeah. okay, let's move on to our next question. Um, because we're kind of edging towards it, I think, in kind of the timeline of your life. Mm -hmm. Um, how did you meet the devotees and or how did you discover Krishna consciousness? Yeah, so I mean, I'd heard of Hare Krishna. Uh it was you know, in movies, things like this, uh, it was always a joke. It was a punchline. <laughs> you know, the, the the word Hare Krishna was usually a punchline to something else. Um, the first time I remember meeting devotees, actually, interestingly, the um, and I didn't realize at the time, it's one of these things that you remember later in life. When I was about, gosh, I must have been about maybe six or seven years old something like that, maybe even younger, but around that age, I remember being in my grandmother's house. She lived on the same road as us in Blackpool. And I remember just, I can clearly remember sitting on the floor in one of her rooms, looking at her bookshelf and seeing this book, which had what we now know is the cover of um, The Laws of Nature and Infallible Justice. It's the one where you have the three modes of material nature and then they're 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 acting as like puppeteers mm. and they have one man who's the the worker and one man that's the boss and then they're they're kind of puppeteering this person and i remember just holding this book and staring at it for what felt like a really really long time and then years later when i saw that picture it kind of brought that memory to mind again so the first time i held in my hands one of you know, I held Shasta in my hand, as far as I remember, was around that time. And then when I was about um, 16 years old, uh, I had a summer job in Blackpool working in a fast food restaurant, along with another friend of mine, a really, really good friend. Um, uh, she, she was like my best friend uh, for many years, and she and I worked together. And at the end of the day, her boyfriend met us and we were like a, a trio, like the, the odd, we, we called ourselves the odd threesome. And um, we were walking home from work in Blackpool in the town center. And they said, oh, these guys over here, give them some money. They'll give you a book. They're really cool. <laughs> and um, so I did. I, I they, they stopped us. I just gave whatever I had in my pocket, probably about. 60 pence something ridiculous and they gave me a copy of on the way to krishna 
and I put it in my bookshelf. I didn't read it for, until I became a devotee. Mm. Uh, but every time I was looking at my books, trying to find something to read, my eyes would sort of stop on that book. It was, it's like the book itself had this power to capture your, your attention, uh, but I never actually read it at the time. Years later, I used to go to Blackpool on book distribution and one of my rituals every time I went there was that at least I had to distribute at least one book standing in the spot where I first received my first book. <laughs> so I did that. Cool. Yeah, that was usually at the end of the day because I preferred to work in a different place doing book distribution. Mm -hmm. But always at the end of the day, I would always make a point of walking down, standing in that spot. And I always had to do at least one book in, in the place where I got my first book. Mm -hmm. So that was the first time I met the devotees. But I didn't really do anything about it. I don't think I even made the connection between the book and Hare Krishna. I probably didn't even realize it was Hare Krishna. It was just a monk gave me a book, something spiritual. Uh, I, like many devotees, I had the experience of seeing the picture of Krishna on the front and feeling as if I knew exactly what this was, mm -hmm. feeling as if it had always been it never even crossed my mind to wonder what is this it was like there was a familiarity there looking at the pictures of krishna um so that was the first time i got a book but then when we were so 1994 uh those two people that i mentioned uh danielle and mark they unbeknownst to me were getting interested in krishna consciousness they were actually I think there were the devotees had started passing out copies of Srila Prabhupada Lila Marita, like the six volume version. And they were just giving out random copies of Prabhupada Lila Marita on the street. So they'd been reading, they'd been trying to sort of collect the whole set and they'd been reading Srila Prabhupada's life uh, and reading other books as well. I remember one time Danielle came to my house and, you know, we were, smoking a lot of marijuana and and she was just talking and talking and talking and talking about krishna consciousness and i had no idea what she was talking about it was like what are you seeing you know, it was just such the whole thing is i it was it may have been a foreign language it's like i had no idea what she was speaking about but i didn't realize that her mark another friend of ours they were all getting into reading and, and interested in Krishna consciousness. And so the devotees from Scotland in, in the autumn of 1994, they came down to Blackpool to do a festival, a Garanga festival. And they, so these friends basically said, we have to go, we have to go for this thing. So I thought, well, okay, we're going to go to a spiritual festival. I've got to get into the right state of mind if we're doing something spiritual. <laughs> So I got absolutely baked before I went in. <laughs> and um, the, I remember everything. So it, I went in as one person and came out another person. It wow. was such a life-changing experience. It, it was like this was the moment in life when my my whole life completely got turned on its head. And I wasn't expecting that. I didn't go in with that. I didn't know what was going to happen. But um, we we went into the festival. Everyone got given a little bag of dried fruit and nuts, prasadam. We didn't know it was prasad. Um, and everyone, all the devotees were dressed as monks, shaven head, um, which was just such a way out thing. Mm. Um but what what it did well one of the things that happened during this festival was that it communicated to me that spiritual life is not just a hobby it's a it's a serious business mm -hmm. you know if you want to be serious about spiritual life you've got to be serious now at that time being a monk that's you know being serious meant you become a monk nowadays it would be nice to try to find other ways to communicate how serious you need to be uh, if you want to be successful in spiritual life. But at that time, it really communicated to me that these people are serious. You know, that it's not just a hobby for them. They're not just getting stoned and 
talking about vague spiritual concepts. They've absolutely dedicated their lives to this. And it really had a powerful impression on me. And um, the kirtan just had a, a strong, you know, the vibration had a strong impression without me really understanding why. The dramas, uh, they did the, I know they did the boatman and the scholar. And somehow when it came to the end and they said, you know, you don't know anything about the holy name, you've wasted 100% of your life. I think, I don't know what happened, but something inside me was just convinced by everything that they were saying. And, but the thing that sort of hit me the most was that the devotee that was sort of heading up the festival, he asked for a volunteer from the audience. I've tried doing this myself years in the years since, but I can never quite pull it off. But it was this thing where point to your head, point to your arm, point to your, you know, whose head is it? It's my head. Whose arm is it? It's my arm. Whose chest is it? It's my chest. So on and so on and so on. Okay, now can you point to you? And he didn't know quite what to do. No, no, we've already established that's your chest. That's your head. This is your body. Who are you? And my whole life, I had I'd been of, of the understanding that I have a soul. And all of a sudden, no, no, I am the soul. And everything, my whole life got turned on its head. I, I am the soul. That's who I am. And somehow in such a simple demonstration, I was absolutely convinced. Absolutely convinced. Now, I was at, when I walked out of this festival, I was convinced that if there was truth to be found anywhere, this is where it would be found. But I also really didn't want to follow the four regulative principles, especially two of them in particular. So it took me many, many, many more months after that before I really started to sort of tried to do anything about it i was deliberately keeping it at arm's length but it was like okay you've 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 found what you were searching for now what what are you going to do about it um anyway i'm sort of going on a little mm. do you want to it's okay no it's okay yeah yeah i mean like so, 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 so autumn so autumn 1994 you met the devotees mm -hmm. the devotees from scotland i think yeah, you said yeah. came down to blackpool for a for a festival uh, mm -hmm. I know at some point after that you moved to Karuna Bhavan. Mm -hmm. So, so what happened in in what I think is a short period of time mm. for you to be, you know, having these thoughts about mm, I'm not sure about the four regs to moving into Karuna Bhavan. <laughs> How did that transition happen? Well, the first thing that happened was that my two friends, Mark and Danielle, they did that because immediately after this festival, mm. they started, the devotees started doing a weekly Namahata in yeah. Blackpool, uh, the same venue that the festival was at. It was at the uh, Blackpool Central Library. Yeah. So um, they would go every week. And me and Mark, by this time, I was no longer working in a fast food restaurant. I was working in a nursing home. I spent three years working as a care assistant in a nursing home. In fact, at the point that I was getting into Krishna consciousness, I was seriously thinking about actually doing nursing training as a, as a career. Um, but I was a care assistant and he and I were working in the same place. He was working the night shift. I was working the day shift. So I would finish at nine o'clock. He would begin at nine o'clock. And the Namahata in Blackpool was from seven o'clock till nine o'clock. So he and I were really good friends. So he asked me as a favor, can I stay on an extra hour at work and finish at 10 instead of nine? And then he can go to the Namahat. So my first service, my first sadhana was that once a week, I would do an extra hour at work so that my friend could get the association of devotees and then he when he came to work he always had some cauliflower pakoras so that was my month that was my weekly sadhana was uh a sort of facilitate someone else being krishna conscious and and having some prasadam once mm. a week and then i they were really sort of trying to encourage me to go along as well and probably around about February or March of 95, I started 
occasionally going along to the Namahat. And every time I went, actually, the devotee that was heading up the traveling Sankatan party at that time was Gadai Garanga Prabhu in Blackpool. And he was a fantastic, he 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 was a really, really good, dynamic, charismatic speaker. And 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 he was very encouraging and he was very sort of down to earth. You know, he would he would laugh and joke about some of the crazy things that he'd done. And it helped us to sort of see beyond the awe and reverence and, and see the devotees as people mm. with their own, you know, their own stories and, and, and their own histories. And he wouldn't um he wouldn't criticize us for not being very serious about Krishna consciousness. He knew that we were going out at the weekends, going to nightclubs and raves and all the rest of it. And he would just laugh and joke about it. And then he would, he would kind of turn the Namahata into a bit of a rave. You know, his, his Kirtans had that sort of element that we were experiencing at the weekends. And we were realizing that actually whatever we're experiencing at the weekend, we can also get it through Krishna consciousness. Um, but without the need to spend a lot of money and wreck our heads and bodies at the same time. And um, so he was a fantastic preacher. And and actually one of one thing that happened probably around about um I don't know, April or May of that year, was that I'd missed two or three weeks. I'd not been for a few weeks to the Namaha, and I didn't think much of it. And then he phoned me up out of the blue. I didn't even know he had my number. He just phoned me up to say, oh, I was missing you the last few weeks. I was just wanting to see how you were. And um, and it was like the first time that devotees had taken a very, very personal interest in me. Mm. And it's somehow it really, I, I can't remember exactly what he said, but something about it made me feel wanted and cared for. And so I, and, and so I started going a lot more often. And then it was like a snowball effect. Mm. It, it was, we didn't even realize it was happening, but we were getting more and more and more serious about Krishna consciousness. We we still went that year to a load of, you know, we went to Glastonbury and I went to the WOMAD festival and I was actually, I, I, I was really feeling this sensation of having one foot here and one foot here and being pulled in two different directions and it was becoming very uncomfortable. And uh, the funny thing is I'd been to the Glastonbury Festival for at least the two previous years. I'd never seen a single devotee. We went that year and we couldn't get away from them. <laughs> they were everywhere, everywhere, even to the point where a friend, of myself and a friend, we were huddled in a blanket sitting outside one of the uh, tents at Glastonbury listening to one of our favorite sort of techno artists and he started sampling the maha mantra as part of his set and it's like what the hell's going on you know we couldn't get away from devotees so i i, I was given a set of beads at that festival glastonbury in 1995 and i had a train ticket home but in my completely intoxicated mind i came up with the idea that it'll be more fun to hitchhike than it will to get the train so me and a friend we you know once everything's finished and the train's already left we're finding ourselves sitting on the side of a motorway thinking what the hell have we done why didn't we just get the train and he and i were getting more and more sort of winding each other up and I was thinking, I'm going to end up getting in a fight with this person. And then I remembered that I had these beads that someone had given me. So the very, very first round of Japa that I chanted was sitting on the side of the motorway um, trying to get home from Glastonbury. So I chanted around and then the next car just came, stopped and took us all the way in one go, right the way from Glastonbury, all the way back home in one go. Uh, so that wow. was my first round of Japa. And then once that sort of festival period was over it there was a real sense of okay we this is drifting into the past now mm. and krishna's in the future i still didn't want to join the temple um but i started helping out the devotees regularly 
Um, I'm going on. I'm really sort of waffling on. No, it's here. okay. It's just... I mean, I mean, okay. it, it it's fine. <laughs> I, I, I love it. I love to hear everyone's stories. So, yeah, yeah. so, so we're now around the 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 kind of. <laughs> The summer of 1995. Yeah, yeah. And I, summer and I, heading I, into autumn. And I know that you moved into Karuna Bhavan in 1995. Yeah, yeah, that was... So basically, we started advertising festivals yeah. and helping out and doing service, putting up posters, stickers, all these kind of things. And then we helped advertise one particular festival. I think it was in Leeds. And we went back afterwards to the Sankirtan house, which the devotees used to have mm. just close to Huddersfield. Mm. And then the... The devotee who at that time, Balabhadra Prabhu, he he was there uh, and he, you know, he was a very, yeah, there's a history with Balabhadra. Um, I don't know if today is the best time to get into that history, but there were good times and there were bad times. Uh, towards the end, it was more bad times than good times. But he was a charismatic person. He was a dynamic person. And when he was good, he was really good. When he was encouraging, he was really good at encouraging. Um, most devotees have had a similar sort of impression that when he took sannyas, that was when he sort of really started going downhill. That as, as a grihastri sort of was in the right, that was the right place for him to be. Mm. And so in, in that sort of, in that, situation it was able to bring out the best in him uh so he was he he was he was a really good kind of back to leader type person really good at encouraging bactas and sankatan devotees these kind of things so he basically said just give it a try just come and move into the temple give it a try um and so that's what we did we we moved in and i was there from um october of 95 until around about february of 96 so however long that is, October, November, December, about five months. Yeah. And it was difficult. It was really difficult. Uh, you know, Karuna Bhavan is a very, especially at that time, was a very intense, full on mm. sort of, um, it was like a boot camp. You know, it was like this really intensive sort of military environment um, for those few devotees that were able to exist in that sort of environment it it really brought out incredible qualities and incredible levels of um <clears throat> dedication commitment renunciation austerity hard work you know they did incredible things for Prabhupada and for Lord Chaitanya many many so many books were distributed and so much mm. Lakshmi collected and so much preaching went on um but many people sort of came and went because it was such a an intense environment so after five months I I sort of mm. left um but it's one of these things where when you're there you hate it when you leave, you can't stop thinking about it. And I always kept going to the Namaha. I, uh, they actually changed over the leadership of um, the Sankatan party. So uh, Gudruma Bihari Prabhu, who you may know. I know him Dabba very well, yeah. Center. I know him very well. He's just a saint. And he was, you know, Gadai was very sort of full-on uh, military kind of mood, which has its place. Gudruma was much more about looking after people and caring people and en encouraging people, empowering people. Um, so he was really looking after us in a different way. And, and this isn't a, this isn't a criticism of Gadai. It's two different styles mm. of leadership, mm. both of which have the place. And, um, but Gudruma was much more, was a more sort of caring and sensitive person. And, mm. uh, in December of that year, he said, at least come and do a few days for the Christmas marathon. So a few of us went over from Blackpool and also uh, from other places as well. Radhika Nagara, who I don't know if you know, came over from Hull. He was back to Carlos at the time. He's in Mayapur now. A uh, few people from Bradford, someone from York whole load of us from Blackpool. So, and then plus the devotees that were there as well. Mm. So all together at one point, there were about 15 of us in this little Sankatan house and the atmosphere was just electric. And that that set up that year, all these can collections. So for devotees who felt nervous and uncomfortable about approaching people and trying to distribute books, they could just stand there and shake a can. 
<laughs> and it was good because it made you feel like okay i'm i'm able to do something without doing the thing that i feel uncomfortable about hmm. and so we all went for a few days and 27 years later i was still there at karuna bhavan wow Some, somehow wow. gadruma's somehow gadruma was the for me and my nature it was him that i needed he he was the person who really saw kind of, of a kind of a pastoral leader. Yeah, um, he he was wonderful. Kind of pastoral care. Um, what, before I forget to ask, what mm -hmm. whatever did happen to Danielle and Mark? They've both actually passed away since. Oh uh, no. Yeah, yeah. S Danielle got initiated as Sita Sundari, and um, she stayed in the temple for some time. Eventually, she moved back to Blackpool, and uh, I lost touch with her for some time. But then, around about gosh 10 years ago i sort of started reconnecting with her a little bit no it was more than that it was uh it must be around about 20 years ago now i sort of started reconnecting with her a little bit and mm -hmm. we kept in touch uh but she always had a lot of health issues uh both mental and physical uh she had diabetes she had other sort of health problems um and eventually and she had some health problems that meant that she passed away uh when she was around about 41. And then Mark uh, passed away in his late 30s. Uh, he had cancer. Um, but he was distributing Srila Prabhupada's books. He wasn't living in the temple. He had a wife and children in Manchester. But what he was doing was he was getting sponsored sets of Srila Prabhupada's books. So other people were sponsoring the sets. And he was going to schools, libraries, hospitals, prisons and and getting those people to take these books and to put them in their libraries and even in the last few weeks of his life when he he could barely walk he was just dragging himself mm. from place to place to to get these books placed in, in in you know so right up until the very very end he was uh sort of fighting for Srila Prabhupada and I spoke with his father at his funeral. I, I delivered a little eulogy at his funeral and I spoke with his father and his father said, I need to speak to you. He said, because I was there when Mark passed away. Oh, just a second. Let me just decline this. Sorry about that. No worries. I get, I get <laughs> messages on my laptop all the time. <laughs> Sorry. Let, let me just, um, put, do not disturb. Him. Okay. Um, what was I saying? Yeah. So he was, um, his, his dad said, I was there when Mark passed away and something happened. And I don't understand what it was that happened. Mm -hmm. He said he was, he was struggling to breathe and he was lying there and it was obvious that the end was coming. And they said, all of a sudden he grabbed from the side of his bed, his Bhagavad Gita. He put it to his chest and then he turned over and paid his obeisances and, and left his body. And he said the atmosphere in the room was electric. And his dad said, I don't understand what happened, but something happened. And 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 now I believe more than ever that whatever it is you lot found in Krishna consciousness, that there's a lot more to it than I ever realized, you know. Wow. Yeah. So it seems that he had a very, very auspicious departure. That's so, quite something, isn't it? That's a really yeah. yeah. Um, wonderful story actually to hear um yeah because we often meet people and people take an interest in krishna consciousness but people have different paths in life and people go down different paths um yeah and so that's kind of actually quite quite encouraging to hear um yeah. i'm going to move on in a minute to the question about kind of kruna bhava and things you've done mm -hmm. over the years but one particular question i have for you we were, you were talking about balabhadra mm -hmm. so i i really wanted to interview balabhadra for my book oh um... and i i tried to secure an interview but i wasn't successful unfortunately i've tried to reach out a few recently mm -hmm. again but it hasn't happened i'm aware that i think balabhadra left around 2005 as in left kruna bhavan mm -hmm. that you were there around 10 years at the same time as balabhadra uh, yeah, I I was. Nine years. I joined in ninety five. I was initiated by him in the beginning of nineteen ninety eight, and then I was 
<laughs> I was I was under his shelter until my wife and I literally ran away <laughs> in 2005. We had to. That's a whole other. We yeah. can get into that if you that want. Was, but... That was my kind of long winded question: Is did you receive initiation from him? And you, yeah. the answer is yes. So yeah, I I, I was initiated. I I got Hari Nam from him in '98, and then I was given um, Brahman Diksha in 2000, uh, Gorapanim 2000, and then. After Balabhadra left, uh, a few years after Balabhadra left, we sort of, I, I, I've I, come to appreciate the term reaffirmed our vows rather than reinitiation. Mm. Mm. Um, I don't think you can, I don't think there's a, even the term itself, reinitiation doesn't make sense because initiation means beginning. So does that mean you're beginning again? You're starting all over again? Mm. You know, you've done 10, 15, 20 years of devotional service. And now you have to start again. Mm. So I heard someone use the term. I, I can't remember who it was. It may have even been Shiva or Maharaj. But someone used the term re reaffirm our vows, just sort of re recommit ourselves, you know. So I, I did that and sort of um, took shelter of Shiva Ram Swami. Yeah. And did 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 he give did he give you the name Ramananda or was the name? Yeah, I was Patita Pavan Ramdas. Oh wow! For for however ten years, around about ten years, I was Patita. Usually PP Ram. <laughs> I was I was PP Ram for about ten years, and then I became Ramananda. Wow, it's quite amazing to me. I've met a number of devotees over the years have had like two or three names. Yeah, uh, I actually think God, God Bahari Bahari's had like three names or something. He has. Um, yeah, he was initiated yeah. by Jayatirtha, Bhagavan, and then Balabhadra. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Quite, quite, I quite think a... that that'll. I think over time that sort of understanding of initiation mm. needs to change, um, because you you know. You, Actually, Shiva Ramaraj gave a really nice initiation class. I think it was at Ram Prasad Prabhu's initiation. And he said, and this is this is an analogy which really clicked with me at the time, and it continues to resonate with me to the present day, that, um, you know, the Krishna consciousness movement is, is an educational movement. We're, we're, we're here to learn about Krishna. We're here to study and learn and... and um, and, and and be trained under various teachers. So when you go to university, I didn't go to university, but when you go to university, you you have an interview with someone and that person approves you. And then they sign you in, you sign to commit. But then once you're in there, you go to so many different subjects and lectures given by so many different people mm. and you will always have that appreciation and gratitude to the person who saw something in you that they felt qualifies you to be a part of that university but you, you will also in the course of your studies develop an appreciation and affection for different teachers, different styles of presentation. E even your interests may change a little. You may go to the university intending to study one subject, mm. and then you end up studying another subject. So Maharaj was actually saying that. He said that, you know, the, 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 the process of Diksha is kind of signing you into the university. But once you're in there, you know, it's not that you're only going to have one teacher. Some people may, um, but not necessarily, mm. you know. So we shouldn't, you know, that this whole concept of initiation, I think, is sometimes a misunderstood mm. concept. I mm. think it's something that we we want to try and get a, a better understanding of. Mm. I think if, if I'm honest, I also have sometimes I have an issue with the term initiation because mm. initiate means to start. We, we've mm. kind of talked about that already. And so in uh, in ISKCON, which is our kind of background, the map that we've been involved with uh, for uh, what can happen these days is you can be doing you can it can take two or three years before you have your initiation ceremony. Mm. Yeah. Whereas in Prabhupada's time, it was much more at the beginning or towards mm. the beginning of your time in Krishna consciousness. So, mm. uh, I mean, that's just a personal view. I think, you know, sometimes you have to just tr um, have faith in people or trust people that you know, waiting two years for an initiation ceremony might be a bit of a long time 
Uh, yeah, but but I agree with what you're saying about the use mm. of the terminology and everything. Um, mm. uh, also, just on that point, um, yeah. I think it was Mahatma Prabhu. He he gave a, a probably an initiation class at Karuna Bhavan, and he was saying that um, initiation is not an event; it's a process. Mm. So we tend to think of initiation as being the event, the actual, that thing that takes one hour, one afternoon, that's the initiation. But the process of initiation is something that can take place over a num over quite a long period of time. Uh, Bhaktivinoda Thakur has written about it. It's there in the uh, Hari Bhakti Vilas that, um, you know, it's, 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 it's a drawn out process mm. uh, that, that be begins with, it's basically the process from, from Shraddha to Bhajana Kriya, which can take quite some time. That that is like the 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 um the experience of the beginning of our spiritual journey. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so let's move on. Um, because I'm I'm it's funny, we were before we started recording this, <laughs> uh, we were thinking oh, an hour or you know, two hours is a long time. Yeah. But believe it or not, there's still so much we could talk about, and I'm happy to yeah. go on as long as you want to go on for. But I wanna, you know, I wanna um move on to the next bit 27 years is is a long time isn't it in one sense in one sense it's not in the grand scheme of eternity but 27 mm. years uh you have been linked with the karuna bhavan temple the karuna bhavan temple 28 um, 28, 28 years 28 <laughs> 28 years wow 20, um, 28 years this many months this many days this many... <laughs> you've got a calendar on the wall maybe. yeah like uh, uh, <laughs> it's like I, mean, I was I was I was going to say something awful. Then it's like you're in the prison, kind of putting the scratches when, when on the you, wall. When can you when can you get out? Yeah. Uh, tell us a bit about just just some of the services you've been involved with over the last twenty eight mm. years at Karuna Bhavan. Well, from when I joined to when we moved out of the ashram, it was book distribution, uh, book distribution, and and uh, Namahat preaching. Especially that was actually something that Gudruma again. Uh, shout out to Gudruma. He really encouraged young devotees and made you feel that you were capable of doing more than you realized you were. And he would see things in devotees that they maybe saw, maybe didn't see, but certainly didn't think that they could really um, make that their service. Mm. Um, so he saw something in me a an enthusiasm for speaking and uh sort of talking to people about krishna consciousness and he got me involved in as many namahatas as i could possibly handle so sometimes i was doing four or five a week like practically every night because we had programs in blackpool preston lancaster leeds bradford sheffield uh where else york uh liverpool uh, other places as well. I can't think off the top of my head, but we had so many different sort of evening programs going on throughout, excuse me, Yorkshire, Lancashire, North of England. Um, so I was doing book distribution. Uh, I started off very, very timid, a fearful, terrified of being out on the street, terrified of approaching people. Um, eventually I was coerced Um not in the best of ways. Uh, it was a bit threatening. It was basically a case of get yourself together or get out. And and I took it seriously and thought, if I don't improve, I'm actually going to be kicked out of the temple. So that day I went out and spent the whole day praying, just praying and praying and praying and praying and praying nonstop all day long. And then at the end of the day, I had collected 100 pounds for wow. which i which was like unheard of for me and and actually what that that what what that experience gave me and something which i actually um which stuck with me my whole sort of sankirtan life uh because i i don't do book distribution or at least i haven't done for a long time but i did it very intensely for a long time is that you know, devotees ask, what is the technique that works on Sankirtan? Devotees are looking for techniques. They want to know what lines work, what approach works. Well, my experience was that there's two things that are, that you can do to be successful in Sankirtan. Chant Krishna and pray. That That's the technique. 
that 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 will make you a successful book distributor chanting and praying um and so for for 10 years i did full time book distribution i i actually i even won a few marathons uh which at the time was a big thing but looking back it's like <laughs> these things come and go uh but i was quite accomplished as a book distributor for at least in relative terms you know um i uh, my ego tells me i was quite <laughs> quite quite accomplished uh, as a book distributor I, I i was i i was quite sort of consistently steady with with book distribution um but actually the thing which really gave me life uh was namahatas it was it was actually talking to people about krishna sharing krishna with others so i did that for 10 years and then in 2005 uh, my wife and i ran away literally because uh things were going a little crazy at that time um if we've got time we could get so, into that so, so you were both living you were both living at Karuna Bhavan, <laughs> we'd, you we'd been married for five years I was I, we got married in 2000 and this was 2005 we were allowed to talk to each other once every two weeks <laughs> for about half an hour God. that was our that was the first five years of our marriage was um we were allowed <laughs> we were given permission that's terrible that's it was, I think was that's crazy. terrible but the thing is again it comes down to this point of being so institutionalized that you don't realize how terrible it is you know you become so yeah um so sort of drawn in and uh conditioned and convinced by what you're told you know i mean just to give an example and, and i know that I, I tend to be quite an extreme person. So if other devotees who are part of the history at Karuna Bhavan hear me say this, they're probably going to say, you're crazy. That wasn't, that wasn't the case for me. That was just you. But for the first, I think, seven years, something like that, six or seven years, I didn't know the way from the temple to the village. So if you've been to Karuna Bhavan, you know that it's practically in the village. Mm. I didn't know how to get from the temple to the village. We were so sort of isolated and 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 sort of locked into this little bubble that basically we would drive to the temple and we would drive out. And you couldn't just go for a walk, <laughs> you know, or or take a few hours break. You know, it's like I didn't even know how to get to the village. So again, that's maybe just me. I'm sure not everyone had that experience, mm. but it was a very locked in tight, sorry to say, but cult-like environment. Mm. Uh, but the nature of cults is you don't realize you're a part of one very often, mm. Mm. you know? So yeah, and then the last couple of years, sort of from 2003 till 2005, I sort of started to see things and 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 it was a horrible time because in my mind it was like you must be so offensive to be thinking this to be seeing these things in your guru or in your you know in other devotees you're the one that's offensive for thinking like that so for 2 years it was a very horrible time actually mm. um and then I don't want to get into the detail, but something happened. Someone said something to me. Um, it was actually my wife. She said something to me. She let me know about something that was going on. And that was the thing which made me realize I'm not the one that's going crazy. I actually am seeing these things. Mm. And then we decided that night that tomorrow we're just going to, while the devotees are taking prasadam, we're going to, disappear and that's what we did we we ran away <laughs> wow wow yeah. i mean was, very very so what, adventurous and exciting and scandalous what we in terms of what you were experiencing at karuna bhavan as a, as a married couple um were, were there other married couples oh, on yeah. site that were also only allowed to speak to each other at once <laughs> it was week? the case for everyone practically practically everyone was in that situation there weren't many devotees who were married because that was kind of also part of uh, I say Balabhadra Prabhu, he 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 did a lot of good things, but mm. it's it's a little bit like um uh I think one of the phenomena that quite often happens in the Krishna consciousness movement is that devotees are given a position, 
either like a spiritual position or a leadership position. And somehow they convince themselves or they they listen to their own press. You know, you've got when you've got so many people telling you that everything that you say and do is perfect, you start believing it yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, and similarly, if if you're told now you're a guru, then over time you start thinking. So with him, everything that came into his mind was the super soul. Mm-hmm. He, you know, I'm a guru. I'm the external manifestation of the super soul. Therefore, anything which I think that's actually coming from Krishna. And so, you know, whatever his motivations were, um, a lot of devotees went through a lot of difficulty because he was kind of bringing devotees together as a couple, breaking them apart, putting them together with someone else. You know, there was there was even a, a saying that uh, we're going to go for a game of musical matages. You know, you it's like you you like musical chairs. You sort of you go around and you end up sitting next to someone else. Mm. And, you know, so sometimes you you would go into not me personally. I was we were fortunate. I, I, I started associating with my wife and she was the only person I ever associated with. But with some devotees, they would go into a meeting associating with one person, come out with another. You know, and and when devotees did eventually get married, it, that was the same for everyone. It's like the men lived in the men's ashram, the women lives in the women's ashram. Most of the men were out traveling. You couldn't, if you were seen talking to your wife, then it was like, what are you doing, wasting time? We've got things to do, you know. Mm, mm. So how long? So how long did you run away for? Uh, not long actually um interestingly i don't think it was only us but definitely us moving out was a sort of catalyst Mm. it it sparked um it sparked off a situation where um one of the devotees actually actually contacted shiva amaraj and i think some other devotees and basically said things are not the way you think they are at karuna bhavan because we left but just not long before we left kadruma had left Mm. he'd also run away Mm. (laughs) and uh someone else around the same time there, there were three or four devotees who all it was like everyone just started leaving um and then someone got in touch and said look you think Karuna Bhavan is this really far out solid military place, but it's falling apart. And the reason it's falling apart is because things have gone too far. So you need to intervene. So that was when um, devotees came up and basically said to Balabhadra Prabhu, you need to take a break. You need to get away, sort out your health, t- take a year away from Karuna Bhavan. And then they put another devotee, Prabhupadvani Prabhu, who was very nice, very really. I've got, uh, I've got some wonderful memories, and I've got a lot of nice things that I could say about Prabhupadvani. Mm-hmm. He really, he really tried very, very hard. He'd also been through a lot. He'd been dealing with, sort of being Balabhadra's right hand man mm-hmm. <laughs> for years, knowing internally that thing things are not right. But I have to sort of keep going along with it so he'd been through a lot but when he took over he really tried hard to sort of put devotee care back in the center of things and he uh he wanted uh, he reached out to myself and janava priya and basically said please come back there's a place here where you can stay and he really tried looking after us he was really trying to Mm. sort of make up for for some of the difficulties that we'd been through so we were away we stayed at my parents house for about two or three months and then we came back we got a little flat in the village our first idea was to get a job uh but then they said well you can do service at the temple we'll give you a allowance and they or he also arranged that i could do some sankatan keep a certain amount of um income from the sankatan <clears throat> which was actually Srila Prabhupada's mood as well Prabhupada said householders can distribute books to to sort of earn a living mm. so he really tried to accommodate us so we were only away for a few weeks and then we came back and that period actually when um there was maybe an 18 month period that was probably one of the most settled periods in Karuna Bhavan's sort of history, mm. like after after Balabhadra had left, at least that was my personal experience. So the mm. devotees may have experienced different things, but for me, it was a much more settled mm. time. Mm. 
Sorry, I know that I. No, it's fine. I, I love. To drag, sometimes, I tend to sometimes, drag things sometimes out. Sometimes <laughs> I have to think of lots of different questions because mm. some devotees are not sure what to say or or how to respond. But you've got lots mm. of things to say, which I love. When I often, uh, when I think of you, certainly my first experiences of you six, seven years ago, uh, mm. you were doing pajari service, and oh, you yeah. were kind of one of the you know have been doing a lot of pajari service. Um, was that something you t you took up more as a service when you returned to Karuna Bhavan? The the actually. Um... I started learning how to do deity worship almost mm. immediately upon returning, but Sankatan was still my main service for quite a long time. And then over a sort of five year period or so, something like that from, from two must've been from 2005 to 2010, then little by little, by little, by little, the sort of balance started shifting. Um, and then eventually I became fully engaged in deity worship, mm -hmm. um, very intensely engaged. Actually, mm -hmm. I was doing, um, well, for a long time, uh, six days a week, I would wake the deities, <clears throat> excuse me, do the puja for the shalagrams, puja for Giriraj, dress Gornitai, do the breakfast offering, cook the Rajboga, um, <laughs> actually it was it was cook the raj boga do the raj boga offering do the transfer and clean the kitchen <laughs> so from from around about half three in the morning till about half two three o'clock in the afternoon it was just non-stop absolutely non-stop really really intensive hmm. um and it was that because there was a lack of pajaris at Karuna yeah and so you well, were not just a lack um it was also there was a sense of well if we if we can figure out a way for one person to do it why why should we get two people to do it <laughs> you know so that was basically the mood and motivation behind it was that well it'll free up manpower so we can do something else Ooh. elsewhere but that's not really how deity worship should be done deity worship should actually be a, a gentle meditative experience it shouldn't be like this intense you know crazy mind and body breaking experience it should be a a gentle uh, you know creeper moya Prabhu said it's like he describes it as the gentle art of deity worship it should be a a gentle meditative experience so it was difficult to have that gentle meditative sort of mood when you're racing around trying to basically it was kind of one person doing two people's service so you're squeezing mm. in you know for so for instance dressing big deities should take at least an hour and a half doing puja for shalagrams and giraj should take an hour and a half and then you've got all the preparation and cleaning up as well so you've got two things that should take at least an hour and a half each mm doing both of those in two hours so you can sort of imagine it was a very sort of stretched and an intense experience but anyway it was it was a blessing it was a blessing i was i was fully engaged in the lord's service for for a long time um but eventually um you know 10 years of intense 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 sankatan and then another sort of uh 10 years of intense deity worship uh, in 2016. I just had a complete breakdown. Uh, I just, I just, I couldn't do it anymore. I was finished. Absolutely finished. I, I, I came home, went, went, went to bed and stayed there for about three months. <laughs> I, was, I was totally done in. Mm. Um, and then when I went back to doing service, uh, I just, I never really fully recovered from that. Actually, even to this day, I my my hands. Every time I get nervous now, anytime I get nervous or anxious, my hands start shaking, and um, I need to just sort of get away from things. So now I try to keep myself in a situation where, which is a, as free from stress as possible. Not easy when you've got three teenage boys that mm. you're trying to bring up. <laughs> mm. Mm. Yeah, as, yeah, as yeah, possible. definitely, definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, mean, I certainly remember, I think one of my first memories of me being at Karuna Bhavan in probably 2016, when I first visited, mm. was you. It's probably um, me, me on breaking point in 2016. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I certainly remember you being there, and you suddenly uh -huh. just appeared from behind the curtain. Uh, yeah, it was uh, 
quite yeah that's one of my one of my memories sorry i keep taking i, I remember Ch- chitani valabra prabhu who's in newcastle yeah. he he used to laugh because I, I i am quite an intense person it's just my nature i've i've come to accept that now rather than fight against it it's like yeah it's just the way i am yeah, but uh yeah. I, I didn't realize i was doing it but he's he said it was like the phantom of the pajari department because when it came to day to greeting i would kind of Throw the curtain aside and step out and blow blow the conch shell. And it was like this really like everyone was like, whoa, what happened there? You know. <laughs> so sorry, go on. No, no, no. I was sorry I keep taking my earpiece out. There's a massive storm outside, which I suddenly oh. thought there was like a there's a, a crash or something, but there's a storm. And yeah. I'm I'm not sure how that's gonna affect my Wi-Fi, but I it shouldn't. Um we'll have to so just far it's clear, see what happens. Clear and uh, I, I, I I did, wasn't expecting a storm. Um, mm-hmm. Okay, I'm going to ask you another question. I'm kind of conscious mm-hmm. of the time and stuff um, because you're giving very good answers, which is great. And I love this. I'm just sitting back and listening. And and we could have talked in detail about the last 28 years, but we, we have do it. We can do it again sometime. We can do a part two or something. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you a question about, because um, you, I mean, you and I have quite a few things in common. We're both... Um, uh, words are difficult of English heritage of British Mm. heritage and we're both from backgrounds which are not you know of Indian heritage Mm. or we we weren't born in the Hare Krishna movement Um, so I'm kind of keen to get your views on this how can we attract uh, assuming that we want to how can we attract more Westerners Mm -hmm. to the Krishna consciousness movement how can we Mm -hmm. do that to appeal to Western people um it's such a massive subject now um, I, one of the things I would say, which I I sort of feel strongly about, and I think it's one of the things that all too often is overlooked in this conversation, is that when it comes to attracting people to Krishna consciousness, we can make so many external adjustments. And that was also Srila Prabhupada's mood is, you know, try and figure out different ways to present Krishna consciousness. Mm. But I, I don't think we put enough emphasis on the place that our internal consciousness has on successful outreach. And it's a little bit like I was kind of saying my Sankatan experience. What, you know, what it's kind of like asking what's the technique for successful book distribution? Mm. My answer is you, you, you always keep the holy name on your lips and you never stop praying. So I have a similar sort of mood to outreach is that if you know, we had, I'll give an example. We had an experience, um, must be around about 10, 15 years ago, something like that. We start, we, we decided to do every year. Iskon does this world holy name week. And that particular year I was, I was working with Chitani Valabha. No, no, it was Raghunath. I was working with Raghunath Prabhu. He and I really, we've got a really good, strong relationship. We're always kind of bouncing ideas off each other and sort of feeding off each other's ideas. And um, we both wanted to organize a really sort of holy name centric program at Karunabhavan for a week. Increased Japa time, increased Kirtan, really, really put this strong focus on, on chanting and and, and on, on hearing and taking shelter of the holy name. So we did that. And within two days, all these devotees in the village started coming up for the morning program who hadn't been for months, Mm. maybe even years in some cases. They just started coming for the morning program. And we had this impression, you know, Krishna is all attractive. So he's like a magnet. A magnet attracts. A magnet attracts metal to it. You know, metal is drawn by the power of the magnet. So Krishna is all attractive. And when Krishna is there, the living entities will be drawn to Krishna. So if we are very, very seriously, purely Krishna conscious, that will attract people to to the process of Krishna consciousness. So you can, and and this is not to dismiss, you know, I'll get into it as well, the sort of externals. But for me, the most important thing by far is what's going on internally. 
if if we don't have the right thing internally, you know, what is it? Books are the basis. Preaching is the essence. Utility is the principle. Purity is the force. If purity isn't there, we're not going to have that force to 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 move them to to take the movement forward. So, without doubt, the most important thing is that purity and that seriousness about Krishna consciousness. Mm -hmm. Now, that being said, and and I really regret that I didn't sort of look into this a little bit more before we met today it only occurred to me just a few minutes before we came online that i had this um during the um first few months of covid we were all locked away at karuna bhavan and um i was asked can you you know since we're all here and we're not going anywhere can you put together a presentation on how we can improve our outreach so that when we are able to get back out again we can kind of hit the hit the ground running. So I did some research um, and I'm trying to find this in my notes now. Um, but I think what I'll do is I'll just sort of paraphrase it. I, I was researching the different symptoms, qualities, tendencies and natures of different generations. Generation with the baby boomers, Generation X, Generation Y. Uh, where is it up to? Is it? generation z and then there's something called igen i'm not sure what that stands for but that's kind of the next generation moving forward and and i was giving this i was i remember i was giving this presentation at karuna bhavan how we have to see things through their eyes we have to see that the reason we do things the way we do is because for our generation that's the thing that makes sense to us mm. Mm. hierarchy authority you know um all these kind of things it's something that was a it's it's a big part of the culture of baby boomers generation x and so on is that basically you do as you're told you follow your authority you know and so on but as these generations have progressed it's become much more a collaborative mood you know younger generations now they're much more about individual expression, collaboration, um, having their voices heard, and so on. And, and I, I gave this whole presentation with all the proof and all the, you know, I, I gave so much sort of um, kind of evidence-based presentation on how, how we have to change if we want young people to take up Krishna consciousness. And one devotee at the end of it said, no, they have to change. They 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 have to see things the way that we do. And and I was trying to communicate that no, no, it's not that it's not that you ask people to change, it's that this is how they are. And and that's it. And so if you want young people to take up Krishna consciousness, the first thing you want is young devotees to take charge. Uh, and and sort of steer the ship because if you have older people trying to relate to and 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 kind of um take control take mm. charge of a younger generation it's just not going to work you know it just isn't going to work so i i most of my presentation yes i tend to wear western style clothes um i don't personally think either having a shaved head or not is is a big deal i think most people now it's like uh the biggest post podcast in the world sorry i'm just getting tangled up here what is it joe rogan you know is the biggest podcast in the world he has a shaved head so um well either that or he's bald but i think he's buzzed up i'm not sure but uh i don't think that really matters to people so much um i it may be the case that um how we dress may at least um, sort of make people feel that they can relate to us. Mm. But in terms of people actually taking up Krishna consciousness and, and, and taking responsibility for Krishna consciousness, the, the important thing is not what we look like externally. It's more what is our internal consciousness and what is our, how how do we relate to and interact with one another? What what is the the style of communication? What is the style of relationships? 
I don't know if that makes sense or, or do you I, want to it, sort of it does make sense. It, I mean, it does make sense. I'm just enjoying kind of listening <clears> to you. Um, I, I often try not to come off the fence and try and be neutral, but mm -hmm. it, it just so happens I agree mostly with you. So in terms of our behavior, how we treat people. Mm -hmm. I was thinking of two examples from Christianity when you were talking then, how a lot of Christian uh, churches will have a Christian youth worker and they'd be a young person. They're kind of cool mm. and they wear a hoodie, you know, and, uh, you know, they're trying to reach teenagers mm -hmm. and to share, you know, the gospel of Jesus. And, and, and I think, uh, you know, that's something that we can learn from Christianity is to try and encourage younger devotees to preach to, to non devotees to c get them interested in, in Christian consciousness. And then I was thinking mm. about what you said about how we relate to each other mm. and, um, you know, just a personal view. Other people may have different experiences for me, but often I might go to a Hare Krishna temple. Uh, I'm not going to name the temple, but the biggest Hare Krishna <laughs> temple in the UK. And I'll go. Uh, uh, <laughs> Does, doesn't leave too much room. But anyway, go on. You know, I, I've been going there pretty much for 20 years now and I can walk down the corridor and other mm -hmm. people who have also been going for a similar amount of time just won't say anything. Mm. You know, and they're also of Western heritage. And I think, oh, my goodness, is their brain being programmed that they can't talk to other people? Whereas, mm. like, whereas I used to be involved with a Christian church way before I joined the Hare Krishna movement. And I might go back there once every two or three years. Like, oh, hi, Nathan, how are you? And they give me a big hug. Mm. And, and yeah. they just, I, I feel appreciated. I feel valued. Mm. And even though they haven't seen me for two or three years, they say, hi, how are you? And, you know, hugging and stuff. Mm. And I just feel really good. And I feel welcomed, even though theologically mm. I've moved on from there. And I don't know if they know what I'm involved with now, but they just make me feel welcomed. Mm. And in the spiritual tradition that I'm in now, I don't always feel welcomed. Mm. And, and we just have to be better, at, try and be better at being human beings and just showing that you care for somebody. And um, just, just, just a, a, a further note on that. When I got quite involved with Krishna consciousness first 20 years ago, I was kind of, you know, very strongly told it was indicated to me that you know we're not the body which is which is true mm. we accept that philosophically we're not the body everything's temporary people die move on get on with your life you know so i was starting to develop these views that if somebody passes away physically you shouldn't really express emotions you shouldn't really mm. get too attached to your family and i remember being in Prabhupada's room in the manor one day and you know you can lean over and you can look at the letter that's on the table oh, and this particular this particular you know what Prabhupada's writing on a particular day this was at, at Bhaktivedanta Manor and the letter that they had on this particular day was a letter to uh that he wrote in 1969 to the to the disciples of Keshava Maharaj mm -hmm. so Keshava Maharaj was Prabhupada's sannyas guru mm -hmm. and Keshava Maharaj had left his body had uh left the world passed away Mm -hmm. And Prabhupada wrote a letter to Keshav Maharaj's disciples to say, I'm really sorry for your loss, you know, and I'm really sad to hear about this really sad news. And you could feel the emotion mm -hmm. coming through the letter that Prabhupada, even though a Shakti of Avatar, a pure devotee, you know, savior of the Western world, was showing emotion. Mm -hmm. He was showing um, a, a, a sadness that someone had passed away. And mm -hmm. for me, that was a massive eye opener that we can show emotions in mm -hmm. the real world. You know, and and because these mm. are very real experiences, so yeah. um, I I agree with you. Just mm -hmm. be normal and show human experiences and feelings towards others. Yeah, I think if I remember rightly as well that when uh, in the description of um, when Shula Prabhupada received the news actually that Keshav Maharaj has left, he was actually crying. Mm. The devotees came into his room and he was crying and it was it was and then he, he he changed the whole morning program and then he he did a whole morning sort of dedicated to Keshav Maharaj. Mm. But one one of the things which um, I've sort of seen my my experience of Krishna consciousness up until very recently was very limited to mostly Karuna Bhavan. And then a couple of times a year, I've been visiting Hungary. Um, but what I've sort of seen, my experience here in Scotland, and and um, this isn't a, it's a criticism, but it's not an, an accusatory criticism. It's more just, I think that this is something that goes on throughout the world of ISKCON, is that we have what we sort of call the guest program, and then we we have the phenomenon of when those guests become more serious and committed in the Krishna consciousness. And 
I've sort of seen, I've even seen how devotee or people have been coming as guests, very becoming more and more interested mm -hmm. in Krishna consciousness. And they're treated wonderfully. You know, they're, they're really treated very, very nicely. But as soon as those same people make a, a formal commitment or, or at least appear to be more seriously committed in Krishna consciousness, it's like everything changes and they're treated in a much more mm. sort of rigid way that, oh, no, you're a devotee now. So you have to just do as you're told. And, and then and then it goes from there to just they become part of the mm. furniture and 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 you know you you practically forget that they're there mm. so and and i've even seen <clears throat> devotees become a little more committed and then go back to just being <laughs> visiting guests again because well this was nicer than that so let me you know let let me go there again so and we have on sundays i do um a reading sangha and at the moment we're studying the nectar of instruction and the nectar of instruction has always been probably my favorite actually of all of Srila Prabhupada's books and translations and there's so many things there's so many statements that Prabhupada makes in the nectar of instruction which are like um just mission statements but one of the things that he says in in text four because in text four you have the six loving exchanges between devotees and he says the krishna consciousness movement was established to facilitate these six loving exchanges that's the reason it exists it doesn't exist you know a byproduct of the movement is big temples big properties big bank balances, big projects. That's like a byproduct of the society. But the actual reason why ISKCON exists, not just ISKCON, the, the, the Krishna consciousness movement exists, is to facilitate these six loving exchanges. It's all about, you look at Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is the Yuga avatar. Sorry, my computer's shaking, getting so excited. Um, he's the Yuga avatar. He, he came to teach the process of Krishna consciousness. And, and we tend to sort of think about that or present that in a very restricted way. What did Lord Chaitanya came to give? The chanting of Hare Krishna. But what was Lord Chaitanya's example? It was all sadhu sangha. It was all loving exchanges. It was all Krishna kata. You know, you read the Chaitanya Charitamrita, there's actually... Com comparatively, probably fewer descriptions in the Chaitanya Charitamrita of Lord Chaitanya doing Kirtan than there is of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu having Sadhu Sangha and Krishna Kata. So this is what he came to teach by his own example. And this is what he came to give, was these loving devotional relationships. And if we're not doing that, so I, I was speaking with a couple of friends recently, and we were we were we kind of came to this conclusion that we're so busy building and maintaining temples that we don't have time to do the thing that the temple exists for. Mm. The temple exists for six loving exchanges, for kirtan, for Krishna Kata. That's why it exists, but mm. we don't have time. You know, we, we make the morning programs as short as we can get away with because we've got things that need to be done. You know, we, we, we don't have time for, you know, the evening program is almost a thing of the past now mm. in many ISKCON temples. You know, classes and discussions in the evening, many places it doesn't even exist. So that's why the temple exists. It exists to, to study and to discuss and to share and, and, and to have Krishna Katar and to have loving exchanges, to reveal our mind, to inquire confidentially, to give gifts and to receive gifts. This is why it exists, but we don't have time for that mm. because we're too busy building it and maintaining it. Mm. Anyway, you can tell I feel... And it, and it, and it, and it costs money. <laughs> and and, 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 and I, I can't give you the references off the top of my head because I, I, I'm sure I could find them though, but there are, Prabhupada gave... Prabhupada did give examples and talked about how if, you know, there, I think there was one temple in Canada where um, the deity worship, it was taking up so much time. Mm -hmm. he, he, he suggested simplifying the deity worship mm -hmm. so they could, because they weren't distributing books. They weren't out in the community doing things. So he said, you know, simplify the deity worship mm -hmm. and go out and distribute books. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and I, I was, 
I'm chatting to an elderly lady in London recently who's a devotee and she was really struggling with the deity worship because she's getting old and you know mm. she's struggling and I said you know you it's okay to simplify things in terms mm. of you, know, you have to put your health first and stuff Prabhupada Krishna mm. God uh, understands you know uh, so don't mm. be so hard on yourself but yeah I, I completely agree with what mm. you're saying and and Iskon um, has so many big elaborate temples mm. and um, you know it's building some more big elaborate temples mm. where they look great and they're fascinating and they're you know architecturally beautiful but what mm. about the book distribution what about the the, the continuation of preaching to westerners mm. you know Prabhupada yeah. Prabhupada sacrificed so much had two heart mm. attacks on the way to share Krishna consciousness in his 70s mm. with young heathens like us long you know young <laughs> sinful westerners like us mm. you know so we we mustn't absolutely lose focus on that you know i i um i have a, a a theory or a view that now if you're if you're under the age of 40 and you live outside of london mm -hmm. you've never heard of the harry krishnas uh maybe possibly, to some maybe i mean i mean i i do quite a few school programs now and mm -hmm. um even the question, have you heard of the Beatles, is uh, with the under 18s is no. Oh, I, I was in a bookshop about, I was on, I was, <laughs> I think it was, it was towards the end <laughs> before we left. And I was on book distribution, but my mind was cracking. So I ended up in Waterstone's bookshop, just browsing, basically trying to take my mind off everything. And in, in the, sort of you know how waterstones has all these sort of units there so yeah. in the unit in the unit next to the one i was i could hear these two girls talking and they they must have been in the music book section and one of them said to the other oh the beatles <clears throat> were they a band and i was like <laughs> you know, so I, ran, mm -hmm. I was ready to run around and start kind of get yourself cultured you know but yeah people have you know who's george harrison to most people you know, we, we say, oh, George, Har look at this. It's got a forward by George Harrison. Who is George Harrison? Mm. You know, who is George Harrison? Who are the Beatles? Mm. Uh, we, 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 we're we really stuck in the past a lot. Um, we, and, we, 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 sorry, go on. Yeah, no, 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 I, I, mean, I agree with you. And um, and, and uh, my my guru, <laughs> Reed Ayananda Maharaj, mm. on, on at least one occasion, he's talked about the Hare Krishna movement, particularly ISKCON, being seen as a museum. It's like a museum wow. where, you know, it's like things have to change. Uh, well, they, they don't have to, but they should change. And we're, be, we're looking like a museum. You know, we're still stuck in the 1970s with this kind of hippie era where, mm. you know, we wear these clothes and uh, we do these things. And actually, Vaishnavism, if you look at the history of Vaishnavism, like the history of Christianity, it, it can adapt and it can change. And uh, mm. in terms of the way the message is presented and we have to mm. remember Prabhupada talked a lot about time, place, and circumstance uh, in terms mm. of how we share Krishna consciousness. And Prabhupada, even in those 11 mm. years where he was in, in the Western world, or tw 11, 12 years, sorry, he would often uh, change the way the message was, was presented based on the audience he was talking to. Mm -hmm. So so an example uh, that some devotees disagree on is this idea of clothing what should we mm. wear what should our dress code be and absolutely there were times when Prabhupada talked about wearing you know wearing a dhoti oh, yeah. wearing this wearing that there were other times when he said dress is a dead thing you know and these clothes as, were, a, as a dead thing it's a dead thing dress is a dead thing oh dress is i thought you said dress as a dead no 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 thing. no no, no, no. <laughs> well, we are, dress sorry dress is, it's my accent it's my summer no, accent no. um dress uh, is a dead thing uh -huh. and and actually we're not these bodies so actually it doesn't matter no, no. what you wear so you'll have leaders in ISKCON arguing over well Prabhupada said this Prabhupada said that Prabhupada actually said both of those things yeah what was the context that he said them in mm. we have to understand also he was saying that to one disciple because they needed that and that disciple because they needed that mm. and so we have to not get so caught up on on these external things and being mm. stuck in periods of time but actually experiment with new ways to share Christian yeah. consciousness. Um, yeah, Prabhupada's mood was basically do what works, do what works. Um, we, I, 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 sort of digressing, but I think as well it's relevant. We, when we had, because um, it's all about how we, 
how we make Krishna consciousness relevant to the people that we're speaking to. Mm-hmm. And um, when COVID started, I that's when I started my online sangha. Uh, the idea at the time was that people couldn't visit the temple. And so, you know, we should make some sort of facility so at least we can keep in touch with people and keep keep some opportunity for association there. And then over time, it sort of kind of just became my little baby, <laughs> my my Sunday, Sunday Sangha. But um, especially the first few months when everyone was locked down in, in, in COVID and, and people were going through a lot of upheaval, a lot of mental anxiety and stress and things like that. And and my style over the years, especially recently, I've I've tried to be just a lot more down to earth, and and tried to have a not so many airs and graces, and and so I I just tried to just present my own personal day to day experience of Krishna consciousness. Today this was a struggle. T- today, I, uh, the other day, my kid was watching a movie, so I watched a little bit with him, and then he was able to sort of connect something to Krishna, and you know, just try to be more just down to earth and more realistic and more just open about and honest. I'm not a world of charrier. I'm I'm just I'm trying to be Krishna conscious. I chant my rounds. I read Prabhupada's books. I look after my deities. I offer my food. I also have three kids. A couple of them are into football. So I'll sometimes watch a bit of football with them. One of them likes watching movies. So I'll sometimes watch a movie or a TV program with him. Just, you know, just, just try to sort of, you know. And so I was just presenting myself in this way. And, and I remember one of the devotees who was coming, actually said he said i've been visiting the temple for years and this is the first time in my life that i've actually felt i can be a devotee Mm. because very often at the temple we try so hard to sort of present ourselves as sadhus and brahmins and all the rest of it rather than no it's you know we're all struggling back to Godhead. Some of us may may have been struggling a little bit longer. Some of us may have finally got free from a few struggles. But, you know, we're all just people trying to be Krishna conscious. And 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 Krishna consciousness, it it's it's an internal thing. You know, it's it's if you personally find that it helps you to be Krishna conscious wearing a dhoti then go ahead. I quite like sometimes getting dressed up in a dhoti and a kurta. And, and when I'm in Hungary, I have to, because that's just the culture in Hungary. You know, it's like mm. the, the, it's very much sort of old school in terms of how they, you know, so I go along with that when in Rome it's you know, I'm not trying to. And, and, and I Rome. think that's the mood of your Guru Maharaj, isn't it? Kind of dhotis and. and... Very much. And very that, much that's so. great. That's great. Yeah. And that that fits into that's part of the wider Hari Krishna family and, yeah. and the mood of my Guru Maharaj is not to wear dhoti. <laughs> you know? yeah. If you want to wear a T-shirt with your favorite football team on it, fine. There's nothing mm. wrong with that. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm wearing shorts and a T-shirt right now. <laughs> I've also got shorts on as well. Yeah, yeah. That's why I was surprised there was raining because it's been really hot here for a few days. Um, yeah, yeah. But um, um, but but it, it ultimately it's an internal thing. It's like yeah. and and you know that's that's been a little bit of a tension with me because I know, for instance, Shiva Ramaraj is a much more sort of conservative person. But I I do believe that there has to be that sort of space for individualism and and um and just finding what what is it that works for us as individuals if i go to visit the temple here at karunabhavan or i go to the temple in hungary i'll pretty much always wear a, a dhoti and a kurta because that's you know it's it's kind of what's expected and so i'm not going to fight against it but um when i'm at home i i rarely dress like that you know i i uh and and it's you know when I'm chanting Japa, I try to keep my eyes closed, so <laughs> it's you know and 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 what you know it's it's kind of what is it uh, if one offers me with love and devotion a leaf and flower fruit and water so what is it that when we're sitting in front of Krishna mm. what is it exactly that Krishna is looking for within us is he looking for how how we look externally or what we're offering internally 
you know, we, we, we every, you know, the, the class after class after class after class, practically every senior Vaishnava in the movement has made this same point that what Krishna is looking for is is the devotion in our offering. Mm -hmm. It's not. You'll hear it over and over and over again in classes. It's he's not looking for the rice. He's not looking for the subji. He's not looking for the <laughs> dal. He's not looking for the japatis. He's looking for the devotion. He's looking for the bhakti. This is the thing that Krishna accepts. You know, Krishna doesn't take away the dal or the rice because that's not the thing that he accepts. The thing that he mm. takes as the offering is the devotion with which it's offered. And then in that way, the food becomes blessed. Mm. So similarly, in all activities, what is it that Krishna, in our japa, in our reading, in our offering of food, in our, in whatever it is that we're doing, what is it exactly that Krishna is looking for from us? It, it's the devotion with which that thing is done. You know, so I don't know if that, sort of and you know what that's actually a great kind of concluding um <laughs> thing part of the podcast we've been recording from us well about one hour 45 minutes really oh yeah right. it, it, it it's it's quite humorous really um but you know yeah krishna offers whatever we offer with krishna accepts anything we offer with devotion or the things mm. we offer with devotion and i think that's a really important message for us to take away um yeah, we've we've covered a lot of ground in one hour, 45 minutes, and we didn't really touch on 28 years properly and all the things that happened over 28 years. Um, so but it's... I'm think, thinking of writing a little, I'm thinking of writing a memoir of yeah. my, my, my life at Karuna Bhavan. Well, I will certainly buy it. And it's been great to hear your story as well. I mean, obviously, I, I don't know you that well. And I didn't know that, you know, but you're, you're kind of past. I knew you were from Blackpool and things, but, you know, uh, yeah, it's, it's just interesting to hear about what you were doing in your teens and everything. Mm. And uh, yeah, I find that quite fascinating. Mis misbehaving. Yeah, yeah. I, I wasn't into drugs myself. I was more mm. into women. But <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, that also eventually led me to Krishna consciousness. Mm. Um, okay. Um, yeah, I think what I'll do, I'll say goodbye to everyone listening, watching, and we'll have a bit mm -hmm. of a debrief after. But Ramananda Prabhu, it's been great to have you. Thank you, guest uh, On this week's edition of the Harry Christians of Britain podcast. Anytime. Um, <laughs> and and um yeah really appreciate you sharing your story uh um absolutely so thank you to everyone for tuning in this week if you're watching this on facebook or youtube please do put a positive comment please do share the link uh you can like it on both platforms particularly on facebook you can like love and care for it uh, so hopefully you can do all of those things and please do share the link with your friends and family in the pages and facebook groups that you're involved with uh so until next week i'll see you all soon Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Bhav.